Huh? Even the other room is giving us applause. That's how good we are. Um, that talk sounds really awesome, by the way. Uh, if you want to go, I'm not going to stop you. Uh, it's like live dictation of code. Come on. How cool is that? Um, uh, but hello, I'm Andrew, and uh, welcome to a Perler's Python primer. Uh, right before I gave this talk the first time, uh, one of my coworkers took me aside and let me know that that is primer, not primer. Primer is what you put on before you paint. Who knew? Who knew? Um, so, that's there. Eh, I'll talk a little bit more on, on this slide because why not? Because it's a snake and, and it ate its owner. And the bird just, you know, watched. I love it. Um, quick, uh, let's see here. So, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Python and Perl. It's really more a Python 2 Perl 5 talk, for those of you who know the distinctions. Um, curious how many. It's more of a uh, Python 2 Perl 5 comparison rather than a Python 3 Perl 6 comparison since there's flavors of each one. Um, I'm curious, uh, in the room, how many people have used Perl? Some of you? Some of you have used the Perl? Good. My Perlers. Uh, and how many of you have dabbled with the Python? Excellent. How many of you love it? Both sides. Love your Perl, love your Python, make the computer do stuff, it's great. Okay. Excellent. All right. Um, I'm Andrew Grangard. Um, this talk will be up later on Low Level Manager, my blog, assuming I get that up. It'll be easy to find because it'll be the post from this year. Um, so, yeah, so uh, Perl and Python, uh, they get, you know, they're like different and stuff. They're very similar. Uh, Ruby, also very similar. Doesn't get included in our talk because, you know, we only have so much room. But like, let's think about it. They're both interpreted languages, dynamic languages. They're 20 plus years old. Okay, I gave this talk a couple years ago. So they're, they're at least 20 plus years old. Um, and Python 2 and Perl 5 came out very similar to each other in terms of time. Um, a lot of people think of Perl as older and Python as newer. Uh, that's, that's mostly marketing. Uh, they both have uh, multi-threading issues. Uh, on the Python side, this is referred to as the GIL, the Global Interpreter Lock, wherein you can have multiple threads running, but only one of the uh, uh, interpreters can be running at any given time across all of your threads. So, um, large community of packages. Ours is called CPAN. Theirs is called PyPy. That's PYPI, the Python Package Index not to be confused with PYPI, which is also pronounced PyPy, which is a um, different Python interpreter. Um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, where we use lo local lib, they use virtual env, very similar. Um, virtual env is like a step more towards what Perl Brew gets you, but not all the way there. Uh, and there's lots of old versions in the wild that they have to support, both sides. You remember our friends at Red Hat, uh, right? We were, uh, Perl was stuck at like 5.8 for forever because Red Hat Enterprise Linux has a 10 year support cycle and was shipping 5.8, right? Um, and for Python, they were used in the scripts that run Red Hat, like the installer. And so you couldn't update the Python 2 on the package on, that's installed at the system level without breaking their install scripts. And it was Red Hat, so they didn't want to do any work on this. Um, however, that has actually changed. So Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 dropped like a month ago. Um, and Python 3 is now the default Python. So they've actually moved forward on that. Um, they've split them, so they have Python 2 and Python 3 as the executables, and there's not actually a Python. Um, you have to install that and figure out what that might mean. Um, so that's one way to figure that out. Um, on that same RHEL 8, which will be what's supported for the next 10 years, um, we have 526, I believe. So actually some modern stuff now. Um, and, and Red Hat's RHEL 7 and 6 and 5 um, will go away at some point. Um, and uh, Python, where we have Pro 6, they have Python 3. Um, which was, came out, let's see here, 
later. So they were able to see, oh, uh, Pearl 6, very big goal, very ambitious. They started with a somewhat ambitious goal with Python 3000 and then saw how hard Pearl 6 was and decided, we don't, we don't really want to do all that. So they cut back their scope, made a few breaking changes, and moved on. Um, so Python 3 is mostly compatible with Python 2. And depending on who you talk up to, we are either before or after the tipping point where people are actually switching. Um, I have been at companies that switched their Python 2 code base to Python 3 successfully. Um, and now that they are at like 3.6, uh, it's actually, um, I believe it's as fast as Python 2, give or take. And major libraries are getting tired of supporting both. Um, so things are switching. So they're very similar, you know, except for the differences. Um, significant white spaces versus braces and semicolons. Um, scope is different. Uh, I would explain Python scope to you. If I could ever get someone to explain it to me. It, um, it is something that once you understand it, it makes sense. And it seems very natural. But you can't really put that in words. It's sort of like it's block scoped, but things, it's, it's Python scope. Um, and uh, there's, there's more than one way to do it versus the Zen of Python. Um, and there's in, implicit versus explicit. Uh, Perl, Perlers are much more used to doing things implicitly. Um, Python, Pythonistas is the preferred term, uh, is, expects to be more explicit. Um, when you're developing code in Python, it's very normal to play in the REPL. That's how you sort of get a feel for the code. Uh, when I do Perl, I'm, I know we have like four REPLs now, but I still don't have them in my workflow, so I do a lot of um, you know, one-liners to sort of play with something. Is this how this works? Okay. Um, which produces kind of a different flow. Uh, different ideas between PEP8 and Perl Tidy. So PEP8 is the standard for how your Python code should work, uh, should look visually. Um, as opposed to Perl Tidy where there's, you know, there's a lot of switches. There's a couple switches you can change in, in PEP8. But PEP8 is actually a PEP, which is a Python enhancement proposal, maybe, uh, where, which is how the language is designed. And so you, you propose a PEP, and if it goes through, then you know, people look at it. So uh, not all of the core code actually follows PEP8 because a lot of it predated that and it was a pain to update it. But it handles such things as you know, how long your line should be and what they should be indented and when you should indent. Uh, sigils, Python doesn't like them, doesn't have them. Uh, we love our sigils, they're all over the place. Um, because we have typed containers. Uh, uh, this is an interesting one. It's hard to share a package namespace in Python. So like in Perl, especially on CPAN, we're used to like the namespaces are very open, so if you want to make a sub package of somebody else's module, you can just do that and make it, and it's your own little namespace, and it can pull stuff from the other one. Um, very hard to do on Python by the way it looks. Once it finds one on the file system, it's not going to keep looking, and they block each other. Uh, plus plus, don't like plus plus, it's gone. Uh, too many bugs came from plus plus, so decided Guido doesn't like it. Um, similarly, didn't like the ternary, so they have a fake ternary. Um, it's pretty sweet. This equals that if condition else default. I mean, obviously. Um, and auto vivification, they're not even sure what that word means, and, and we count on it all the time. Uh, this is, in fact, the Zen of Python, uh, possibly the only piece of Python poetry. Um, it's a bit Vogon, really. Uh, and in fact, as a cute little pun, so this is actually in the REPL, you can type import this, and it will give you the Zen. Um, that beautiful is better than ugly, and explicit is better than implicit. It's very much a better, which implies worse. As opposed to, there's lots of ways to do it, you know. Uh, simple is better than complex, and complex is better than complicated. And flat is better than nested, and sparse is, 
and on and on. It doesn't even fit on one slide. Um, but a couple important ones, the special cases aren't special enough to break the rules. Uh, in the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. I don't know about you, but like all my Perl code loves to guess and try and figure out what the user wanted to do because that seems more friendly. And in Python, it's considered poor form to do that because if you guess and you guess wrong, they don't notice until later. Um, also, there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. Although that way may not be obvious at first unless you're Dutch. Um, and that should even be more specified, like there should be one way in core, which is kind of neat because then if you say, hey, what JSON do you use? You use JSON. You use the one that's in core. Um, outside of core, there's a lot of ways to do things. Uh, but depending on how deep into the, uh, the belief system you are, you don't see this. Uh, the Dutch reference is to, uh, to Guido, Guido van Rossen, who is the uh, patron saint, as it were, uh, the original benevolent dictator for life, uh, the creator of Python. So that's Guido. He, think, of, think of him as Larry, but not. <laughs> well, with a name like Guido. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a very common Dutch name, apparently. Um, I have met both of these idols. It's, it's very exciting. Um, let, me, let me just be correct. I love both of these languages and uh, both of these communities. They both have a lot of great things. Um, but let's actually look at some Perl and some Python and like, so that you can know what some of the differences are. Um, so an awesome thing, Python has an actual Boolean, true and false. You get to write that out in your code, true and false, instead of one and zero. I was actually really sad when I was uh, making the slides for this and I realized as much as I'd convinced myself that they're really true and false, these are aliases to one and zero. Um, so you can actually do math on them and they'll turn into one and zero, but you, you never do that. You're always expected to actually make a Boolean conditional. Uh, they, they have capital none instead of undef. It's used very much the same way. Uh, if you and it's used almost like an option type wherein you will return either none or the value, uh, where we would return undef or the value. And they spell, el uh, they spell else if elif, so there's that. Um, so if, elif, else. It's one word, elif. Can't do else if. Um, white space is important. Uh, it is used instead of a semicolon. So new lines generally terminate a statement, except. Uh, so you can use an explicit uh, line continuation character, like we're using here on B. So B is going to be equal to a long string. Um, this is actually one of the only spots where there's an implicit operator. If you put two strings together, they just concatenate. Um, so. Good to be explicit, except, you know, sometimes. Uh, and so for a newbie Python person, you will often see them write really long lines because they're not sure where they can split them um, or that they can split their strings. And, and if you do this and you actually use a line continuator, people are like, why are you doing that? What is this? Uh, but you can also break at any point in the middle of uh, bracket-like characters. So break squiggly braces, hard braces, or parentheses. Um, and in fact, so this C foo equals one, two. So this is a function foo that takes two parameters, one and two. That is official um, uh, indentation style. So if you put an argument on the first line, then the next line will be a hanging indent. Whereas if we had a new, if you decided to put the new line in front of the one, it would just be indented one line, one indentation over. Um, now there's no semicolons. Well, there are. You can use a semicolon to separate uh, statements if you want to put them on the same line. Would never get through code review. Your, your coworkers say, what are you doing? Um, so they, but they don't like semicolons. They love full colons. So you've got full colons to indicate the end or start of a block, uh, excuse me, the start of a block. There's no indicator that you're at the end of the block. You just end. So this is 
an if statement, if true, print win, else, print fall. Print fail is how you'd read that. Um, and so that indentation of print shows that it is part of that if block. And the fact that else is outdented to the same level, it, you know that it's not part of that block. So what if the, what if it were three spaces instead of four? Yes. Don't do that. Um, so, yes. So the question was, what if it was like three spaces instead of four? So you can use the amount of spaces you want to use. Um, and in fact, you'll see four is a pretty common standard, but so is two. Uh, Google pushes two. Any place where you have a lot of function nesting, you go with two to squish it up. You can use, I think you can use an odd number of spacings, but you do have to be consistent, and it gets more, and you have to be consistent at each level. You can even mix tabs and spaces. Don't, don't do that. Um, so these could be a tab, or they could be spaces. But they just need to be white space, and they need to be an equivalent amount of white space within a given block. And if not, that's going to be a, a compiler warning of, I don't know where this line goes. It will say, unexpected indentation, I believe is the error. Yeah. So if you went three and then four, it would say, I, I don't know why you changed indentation here. Yeah. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, and so blocks. Blocks are delimited, again, by the colon. So a for loop I actually have fairly fun syntax. It's four variable in um, container. So for i in items. Um, and that is something that is iterable. So it's either like something like an array. Uh, if it's a string, if you put the actual string items in quotes there, you would get it by letter because that's how you iterate through a string is by letter. Um, so in this case, we would have for i in items. Now we're indented, so we know we're inside the for loop. And each time through the uh, for loop, as you would expect, i is going to get one, item, one of the elements of items. Um, I didn't name them items so that you know that that's a container type of some form, either an array or a tuple, because you know, we don't have any sigils. No sigils. So just, just squint and pretend they're there. So that, pretend that's got a little ampersand in front of it. Um, and then we've got our uh, an if block. So if foo, which presumably was defined somewhere up scope, uh, then I'm going to do thing, and I'm going to pass that i. Otherwise, I'm going to do some other thing. And if do bar thing was to return true, I would go onto the break. And if it returned false, um, actually, that I don't even know what would happen if, oh wait, no, if it would return false, we would go down to the else, and then we would pass. So there's a couple things to see here. So break is how you would get out of that for loop. And pass is a no-op. And it's there because a block needs to have something in it because you have significant white space. So the else block is empty, which means you have to use pass. The else is not, uh, the else is not actually required. Um, so yes, yeah, so this else is actually completely superfluous, except of course that it shows that you're explicitly wanting to pass. Now, uh, an exciting thing with the scope here, so I brought i into scope in the for loop, but you still have access to it outside of the for loop. So I can say, hey, my final i was this. No, so I just brought it into scope on the for loop. So, right, you're used to a my variable in the for loop is scoped to the loop. You're essentially scoped to the sub, is sort of how the rule how the ruling works. Um, or if it's in global scope, you can maybe see it depending on if it's been declared global. I'm not even going to touch that part of Python scope, but uh, you don't have to pre-declare things. They just pop into existence, and they pop into existence for the whole um, function that you're in. Now, a fun thing here is if, it, as a lead on to that, if inside of one of these blocks I had created a new variable. So like, if I set do foo thing i, if I put that into a variable, like a value, so if I said val equals that, I could get to val in my print statement outside of the loop. But val would only have a value 
if I went through that um, set of blocks, if I went through that path. And it's not that it would be undefined, it's that it would not exist as a variable and it would be an error if I went through one of the other paths. Because we say, attempt to use an unknown variable if I tried to print it. Which is, a, is, an, is, a, is a, uh, an odd little corner of the scoping model. So it's possible to have something that may or may not exist, but exist, right? We have, we have the idea of existence. Uh, this is a more metaphysical existence. That variable name may not exist. Um, so, so don't do that. Like, so if you're going to define something you know, deep in your lobe, you should probably give it a default outside the scope if you want to use it outside the scope. Um, uh, quoting, we got you know, both kinds of quotes, single and double. That wasn't enough. Uh, we've got triple double and triple single quotes which allow both embedded new lines, of, like literal new lines, and single and double quotes. So if you want to quote something that is going to have a mix of quotes, you'll put it in triple quotes. If you happen to have a triple quote in there for some really weird reason, you would probably use the other one. So generally, you, use, you pick per, a personal style between single and double quotes and stick with it, and then you switch if you really need to embed one in the other. And if you need to embed both, you use triple quotes. Um, these triple quoted strings are also used anytime you want, you know, lots of new lines. A bit like a here doc, right? You just put in, type it exactly how you want it to look. Uh, a neat th and then those are also reused. Uh, they're like, hey, since we have this ability to make a multi-line string, if you put a multi-line string as the first item of a subroutine, it becomes the documentation. And that's available to you in the system. Which is actually really awesome. Um, there are, speaking of both ways to do it, there are two ways to interpolate into strings. So strings do not support any native interpolation of like dollar sign variables, etc. So the original one is the percent operator, which ends up working a lot like printf, sprintf, so you put percent codes in your string, and then you run the percent operator, and you fill in the values that you request in the string, and it works um, positionally. So the first one gets the first one, the second one gets the second one. Uh, there are percent codes that you can add. I've just used percent %s to say these were strings. Percent %s uh, works for everything, it all stringifies, so you can just say percent %s. The new way is to use the format method on the string object. And so here you use the squiggly braces, these so-called mustaches. Uh, I don't think anyone in Python says mustaches, but in JavaScript it's gone on to mustaches for that. And so you call dot format and you give it, method, uh, give it the values. Uh, this is really neat in that you can mix them around. So you can do them positionally and say zero, one, two, for the inside the braces on the inside, or you could say, uh, you could name them and then pass format uh, key value pairs and get them interpolated into your string. If you try to percent um, code and you give it the wrong number of arguments, it's gonna catch that. So, yeah. Um, Excellent. That would be, so the, yeah, uh, uh, I will show. Uh, so the, this is a great question from the crowd. Uh, it's a little obscure how the syntax works. So the important part of the syntax is the, uh, the bracing. So the A colon is just a literal A colon that it's gonna show up. So when I print this out, it'll be A colon value of A, B colon value of B. Another question in the middle. Um, yes, so in Python 3, uh, they decided to add a third way. Um, so you now have these F strings, uh, which I'm not fully familiar with. Um, I have glanced at them. Uh, but they let you do this interpolation, but I think they can actually... You put the A inside the braces. You put the A inside the braces? Okay, oh, right. So, um, and I, yeah, and then you don't have to call format, right? It, it's, so the F, the F string, 
So you, you put f in front of your string to declare this is an f string, at which point it will automatically format from the environment. Uh, yeah, follow up from the crowd? Basically the same as the way Ruby's always done strings when you use the f string. Hmm. So uh, the, the crowd uh, reminds us that it's roughly the way that Ruby does strings and has always done them with f strings. Excellent. See, it's all across, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and, uh, and this also shows that right, it's a method because in Python it's mostly objects all the way down. Um, they're not really, but they, they try. It's pretty close. So, it's the significance of that picture. Uh, oh, so this is from the Blues Brothers. Uh, we've got both kinds of music, country and western. <laughs> and they've got both kinds of quotes, double and single. So uh, data structures to get you a uh, mapping between what you're used to and what you use in Python. So Python has a list, a tuple, a dictionary, and a set. So a list is what we think of as an array. It's growable. Um, you can index into it. All of these use uh, the hard braces to index. Um, a tuple looks like a list. And uh, we use arrays for both list and tuple semantics. Tuples are when you want that's it. The difference is that a tuple is immutable and it's of a fixed length from when you defined it. And it's mostly used to uh, pass groups of values around. Um, so if you have something that returns a tuple, you can denature it um, with tuple syntax. So, well, let's first do the list. I'll stick with my list. So a list you declare with the opening brace and then values. Um, it is not a fixed type, so you can mix Numbers and strings is dynamic language. That's what you would expect. So just like our AX on the right here. Um, for some reason, I chose to look into different values on the right and the left. Cool. Um, so now, if I, this is a tuple example. So if I put into TX the tuple one, two, three, I can then pull that out into the variables a, b, and c, and say a, b, c equals tx, and declare them there. And now a is one, b is two, c is three. Um, you could do that on one line, right? You could do a comma b comma c equals one comma two comma three. That's a little odd. So you might do that for like a couple values, but that you're setting to defaults or something. Um, but you do use it a lot for return values. So if you return two things, you want to pull those two things out as to separate, separate variables rather than getting back a, a tuple and then saying, is tuple zero, blah, is tuple one. Um, so it's, it's a nice way to pretend that there's multiple return values. Um, and what we call a hash, they call a dictionary, because you know, it's longer and more explicit. Um, you use the colon to separate keys. They must be manually quoted. Um, the numbers obviously can be there. They have more limits on what can be a key. Right, you can use like anything as a key in Perl. You can, like throw your hash and it will do something. Uh, it will come up with some stringification of that and use that for the key. And you cannot, all right, you cannot use a mutable object as a key. So you could use a tuple as a key, but you couldn't use an array as a key because someone might change the array and it would get all confused. So that's just not allowed. Um, on the tuple, uh, a fun piece of fact. So, right, it's the parentheses, one, two, three. The parentheses are there to show you, the programmer, that there's a tuple, but the comma is the tuple operator. So you, the reason this is important is that if you want to pass a one item tuple, it looks like parenthesis one, comma, parenthesis. Uh, that's the only time that comes up, but. Uh, so, in fact, where I have parentheses ABC equals TX, I could just have A comma B comma C equals TX. We use the parentheses for some readability. Because there's, there's more than one way to do it. Uh, that Python has sets, which are awesome. We don't have sets, and I miss them every time I come back. Uh, it's like, yeah, you can fake it with a hash. Um, and, and you can, like, this is a great way to fake it with a hash, with a hash slice into an empty, so they become undef. Yeah. Because uh, using undef as the key in your hashes is the smallest way to make a you know, hash. Okay, why, why do we need to know that? We, we shouldn't need to know that, but I bet at least half of you know that, right? That using undef as your key instead of one and then checking with exists makes for a slightly faster, slightly smaller hash. Um, 
but then we don't have set operations. Uh, Python, you can say, given this set and this set, what are the keys that are, not, that are in this one and not in this one? So the union, the disjoint, um, the intersection, you get all of those. And because you have them, then you use them and you think in that method. So it gives you an extra way to think about problems. Uh, whereas I've seen with hashes, right, I've seen this as a common interview question of like, show me the things in this list that are not in that list. And well, you take the list, you make a hash out of it, and then you compare against the other one. And you know, that's just built in. A question from the crowd. The first line of your set uh, thing, is that a syntax error, or, did you, or, or does Python overlap oh. when you use the, uh, the, the, the curly brace on the right side? Uh, thank you for catching that error. That shows that you are watching. That, that's there on purpose. <laughs> Uh, so the, uh, the question from the crowd is, uh, do you have an extra squiggly brace in there? And yes, yes, I have an extra squiggly brace in there. Apologies. I'm, I'm really glad that's the answer because otherwise I would not understand. You would definitely, <laughs> you would definitely not understand Python parsing if there were random extra braces. Uh, they don't really like braces at all, so no, no braces. Um, also, set takes one um, uh, argument, and that's why it gets passed an array of the values. Uh, and then, how do you iterate through a dictionary, right, common use case? Uh, this, again, is better in Python 3. But in Python 2, you have three different methods, iter items, iter keys, and iter values, that are roughly like our values, our keys, and our while each. Who loves while each? While each? For each. Oh, yes. Well, no, while kv equals each d, do thing. Yeah, right, you never use that because you just go through the keys and then make a temporary value to give you the value and then you go through. And that's just boilerplate that we do. We don't even think about it, but there's, there's better ways. So you just get a tuple out of both of them and then you do stuff. Um, but other than that, they do what you would expect them to do. And again, it's a method on the container. Uh, oh, what do functions look like, right? You need to know that. Uh, so they spell sub DEF. So you define a function. Uh, you get to declare what its uh, input parameters are. There's no explicit return, because remember, ex remember implicit is bad, so you have to explicitly return a value if you want to return a value. Uh, so these are equivalent functions. Uh, last night I did finally update this so that, you know, to use signatures on the Perl side, so it doesn't look quite so bad if, you know, right, we have to do our manual stuff. Now they look very similar, right? We can even make our shorter. Um, Python has a different syntax for unnamed subroutines. So their unnamed subroutines are created with the Lambda keyword. So you'll see this. And if you want to, you know, fit in with the Python people, you're going to need to be like, oh, yeah, Lambdas, I got you. Because um, you use them. They're used a little less now that then another thing that's coming of the comprehensions that were added, so you don't need them quite as often, but a lambda function has an implicit return. And so it returns whatever the last value was. So it works more like, uh, right, these are much more equivalent. So lambda parameters colon body, one line. So it's a one line thing. In fact, it's required to be a one line thing. You cannot have a new line in your lambda which also means you cannot have multiple things in your lambda. So you can, you can have multiple statements, and you can put braces here, but you can't have multiple lines. If you want to have multiple lines in your anonymous function, you make a named function, and you stick it in a variable. It's a parser issue. I don't know why. One line's for lambdas. Let's get this. Question. Uh, does that carry through in version three was the question, and I believe so. Lambdas are still one line. Uh, function, they have name parameters. They're awesome. It's really awesome. So you declare the names of the variables, or the parameters. When you call the function, you can use the names to pass the, variable, uh, pass the parameters in. Uh, so in this case, I define foo to take parameters bar, baz, and quux and to declare that Quux has a default value of three. Um, and then I'm just going to return the sum of them. So I can call this as foo one comma two, and the one will be bar and the two will be baz. Quux will be three, so boom. 
six. If I call it with three explicit values, one, two, four, it's called p positionally. I can also call them by name, and I can do it out of order. So I can say bar baz quax, or I can say bar quax baz, because right, they're key values. It, the order is not important. Uh, if I try to call it with the, not the right number of parameters, uh, if I try to call foo one, that is a type error because you gave the wrong number of parameters. Uh, foo one two is not a type error because quax has a default value, so you don't have to pass it in. All right. And that is how name parameters work. And once you have more than about like three parameters, you're expected to generally pass them all in by name to make it more explicit to the reader. Uh, package imports. So there's three types. Import foo imports the package, but doesn't import anything to your namespace. So that's like saying use foo empty. This is default. That's what you use. Or if you want to import a specific thing into your namespace, you say from foo import A and B. So that would import whatever foo.a A was as A and foo.b as B, just like you would expect from use foo quote A B. And you could do from foo import star to imp import everything into your namespace, much like our default use foo. Obviously use foo would have a, you know, it, it defines what the default is, but don't do, that is, Super code smell, like, no, don't do this. We don't like that. You can do it sometimes. You do it inside an internal package to like bring all the things from a sub package and re-export it at the top level. But this throws off your um, run time, uh, your like compile time checks in your editor of like, hey, have these names been used if they were declared somewhere? Whereas once you have a star, you don't know if anything is live. Maybe it was declared in the other module. So that is considered very poor form, it's not done. Um, which is nice because then you look at the top of your Python and you see all the I imports explicitly and you know where everything came from. Uh, modules, packages, they also can't remember, decide what to call them, so they use both names. Uh, what is a package on disk? It means that you have a directory with an init.py in it, which we call init.py but it's really underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, dot pi. If you were in the previous class, you would know that that is referred to as dunder, because it's double underscore. So dunder init, um, that's an empty file that just is, serves as a placeholder that says this is a package. Um, and then if one directory has it, then you can go to the next directory and look there as well. So, and there's two ways to make a foo package. So you can make a foo directory that contains an init.py, or you can make a foo.py file. And in fact, you might start with foo.py, then as it gets more complicated, you uh, split it up and refactor it into a foo directory and put several submodules in there. Uh, but don't have both foo.py and the foo directory. That's, that will make you sad. Uh, I know we do that, right? Like in, in Perl, it's totally common to have you know, a, a .pm and then that same directory for the submodules. Uh, that top level stuff goes into the directory. And so if you had either of these top two, you could say import foo. And either of those would be found if they were in your equivalent to at ink. Um, and they used to have dot, and now they don't have dot, much, much like we don't have dot in the... In fact, setting that up is a pain because they're like, no, you shouldn't be able to just have an environment variable that shows you where to find the things. Side, sidebar. Um, and so you can import foo, and then you could call foo.bar and .baz, assuming there was a baz function inside of bar. Uh, you also see this in your packages. If dunder name equals quoted string dunder main, uh, this will be a little block at the end to make the module runnable, like the modulino concept that we have. So uh, in Python, both modules and executables have the same dot um, pi. So like you can't tell what it is from one or the other, which means that you can do this to make a module that is also executable. And when it's imported as a module, uh, name will not be main, and so this code won't run. So this code will only run if the module is run directly. And so you'll see this even in like, like a library module 
like there might be a demonstration or a test function here, even though this module is intended to be always imported and used. Like this is a fun place to put a, a quick usage. All right, five more minutes, exactly what I have left. Uh, how do you define a class? So you define a class with the keyword class. Uh, you are, uh, you should make it capital, it's not required. Um, so it's class, uh, name, parent class. Uh, you want to, again, you don't have to do this in Python 3 anymore, but there's two types in uh, Python 2. You can either import nothing and you get an old style module, or you import from object and you get a new style module. You generally do the latter now. Um, they're very similar um, in usage, but you get some more stuff under it with a new object. So this is an example of a subclass and a main class. So the main class has a dunder init. So if you make this name, then you're a class, and this will be your constructor. So now if you said foo, um, whatever the parameters here, so foo x would create you a new foo object. Um, so it's not like a new one. And Question. Go in yes. Uh, so this could go in the dunderinit.py or in the foo.py. Yeah. So if inside of my right, this, this would be what would be inside those classes from the previous. Yeah. Thank you for tying that together. Um, so the, the the here I have a foo object that is going to create a parameter x, um, and then the thing you got back from making a new foo, you could use dot x to get that value. Uh, there's no getter, I mean, there's a getter, but um, there's no explicit getter or setter function here, um, but you can actually use them as L values and stick values in there. Uh, but the important thing, uh, this is subclassing, so bar is a subclass of foo, and so you literally say foo there to say that's my parent class, but you also literally say bar down here in super to say, hey, I wanna call the super function uh, as seen from bar for self. This is, this is fixed in Python 3, uh, but you will definitely still see this in Python 2. So you may need to call the init from the parent, and then you do whatever other things you have to do. And that's how you do a subclass. Um, uh, fun fun uh, side, right? Bar needs to be bar. Otherwise, you're gonna tell it to go up some other inheritance tree to find the thing, which I guess you could do. I'm not really sure what happens if you put Baz there. Um, uh, double diamond, and uh, yeah, uh, and actually, they, if you ask a Python Eastern, they will say, no, we have single level inheritance, but you can put in a couple classes uh, for foo and in super, and you can, uh, you, you can import from multiple classes. It's just not done, uh, because it gets messy. Um, but you can actually do multi-level inheritance, it's depth first, left to right. Uh, references. So if you have a function foo, foo parentheses values calls it, just like in Perl. However, foo without any parentheses is a reference to the function foo rather than calling foo with no values. No, you could not. Yes. Well, Okay, that might be the one spot where you could shadow and confuse yourself if you gave a variable the name of a function. That would mess, that, I think you would just shadow it and, and you would no longer be able to access that function. Um, but there's no, that's about the only time, because uh, there's no separate namespacing uh, between, um, yeah, right, we have the five different types of namespacing. That it's all one flat namespace. Uh, but if you declare something that Already exists, yeah, that's, a, that's an edge, I'm not really sure, but I believe that if you declared something to be foo, yeah, don't do that. Um, and, right, because if I said baz equals foo, that's going to set up a reference between baz and foo, and then I can call baz three, uh, and I should probably use both the same letter on those, that would, that would make it work a lot better. Um, uh, and so you don't need like the arrow function because references, so, it's a bit like water and swimming, like because you just automatically get a reference, you don't really think of references in, in Python. This does catch me every so often where I want to call a function and I just put the function name in 
and you know that compiles, but like I'm actually passing the function instead of the value of the function, and then it explodes somewhere later. Uh, exceptions are awesome. We should we should have more of them. Uh, so uh, you know, built in with try and accept and accept else and finally. Oh, just about to go to Q and A. Um, and these exceptions are nice because they're exception classes that inherit from exception. They have the stack trace in them. You can, uh, when you catch it, you can look at that. You can decide what to do. You can re-raise it. Um, and you get to do class-based catching. So right, if you have two different exceptions, you don't have to do string handling to figure out what those exceptions are. Um, and totally awesome to use the REPL. We showed that a little at the beginning. Um, regular expressions uh, totally work but um, they're more verbose because they want it to be more verbose. So like instead of a slash i, it's re.ignore case. Um, and then you get an object back that is either none or not none. Uh, they're very similar. You don't see them much, possibly because strings have a lot of methods for doing some of the things we'd use regexes for. And I think, oh, and I, uh, it's my Q&A time, actually. Um, so I'm going to take one quick question, which was, hey, what are generators and, comp and uh, comprehensions? And let me tell you, <laughs> they are awesome. So uh, these were late, uh, added somewhat late in Python 2. Uh, they use them to get rid of like map and grep uh, type uh, things that we would have had. Uh, they, they used to have map and grep, and they're like uh, not used as much now, uh, deprecated. So if you put in braces using this syntax um, block for variable in container. So this would do, uh, this with the parentheses creates a generator and with the braces creates a literal. Um, so this would do i squared for i in range three, which so that'll give me the squares for zero, one, and two, because range is uh, in not inclusive. The second one gives me a literal list. The first one gives me a, a generator object that would create that list, but is lazy. And now I, uh, I can call next on that, and every time I get next, I'll get one value. And next is the interface that is used when you put a for loop around this. So I could take this generator and return it to you, and then you could say for i in generator, and it would make them one at a time as we went through. I said in the second Yeah. I said yeah. Yes. Boom, boom, boom. And that is totally how you would do it. Yes. The question was, if you put that in a variable, could you then do for i in the variable? And that is exactly what you do with a generator. Um, and so it's common to return a generator to a function that would, where you might just return a list. And this way you can return a generator and it becomes lazy. And then you can um, use these over and over again. And you can actually, you can actually have multiple generators inside that one and they lazily go through the thing. Because, you know, we, from the functional languages, we've learned lazy is good for uh, functions. All right. Um, and last question was open. Uh, so you mentioned, like, scope is weird, and you don't get a destructor that works at a normal time. How do you deal with that? They added the with keyword, which is pretty sweet. So if you do with, it gives you a block that so you say with function that returns a thing that supports with, withable. Good luck lurking, looking for documentation on a stop word. But withable, uh, this return, so if I open a file name and all of the file things will return a withable thing. There's a better word for withable, trust me. Uh, but when you open it, you get back f, which is a file handle, um, just like you would get if you did open file name, except that at the end of its scope, it is guaranteed to be destructed. Normally, that destruction is not guaranteed as to when it will happen. Um, and it's not just destroyed, it actually calls a method in the object that says leave and do your cleanup. And so even if there's an exception and you go off somewhere else, this gets cleaned up. So you wouldn't, we don't need this because we have scope. But if you didn't, like we have, we have guaranteed block scope. But to get around that, you have this with, which is nice because then you get the advantages the rest of the time of not have, of letting the compiler decide when to get rid of things, and then you're explicit when you know you want to get rid of it. Any real questions from the crowd? Uh, these slides will be up later on my low-level manager blog, which you can get to at Spaz Rocks. And uh, feel free to tweet at me.
I'll pretend like I will read them and stuff. What's up? Yes. Oh, yes. comment was from the crowd, if it's so easy, why are there so many books at the bookstore? And the Pearl books are empty. Clearly, they've all been bought. All right. Um, and uh, Simba and Gypsy love you. And um, try not to bite off more than you can eat when you're playing with the snake. I don't know. Um, thank you so much for coming. This was super fun for me. And I hope you learned something about Python. And so it's not so scary. It's, it's the same. It's the same language. It's totally the same. <laughs>